Hello, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to companion webinar called How to Successfully Build Temporary Intercompany Integrations in Dynamics 365 Finance Supply Chain Management. Okay, uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, we are we're a couple minutes in, so yeah, let's get started. So, <clears throat> so first of all, I'm going to start uh, uh, quickly <laughs> with, with with the agenda. So. Uh, uh, first of all, we're gonna briefly introduce the company that uh, I'm coming from, that's called Companial. Then I'm gonna go to the main topic here that we have today. So I'm gonna talk about uh, why the topic that we have here today is relevant and uh, yeah, and uh, what are the requirements that we're facing and what are the requirements that from our experience, uh, Dynamics partners are facing. Uh, <clears throat> then we're gonna talk about the integration challenges that we had to resolve and you might face also when building similar integrations and what integration technologies we used uh, and also i will add to this topic what integration technologies are generally available in dynamics 365 and uh, what kind of uh, integration technologies and integration patterns you should use when building your integrations with dynamics 365 finance supply chain management um, and after that, we're going to have a, a short uh, Q&A session. So please feel free to, to, to drop any questions you have in the Q&A window and after that, uh, or in the message window. And after, after the topics that I'm going to talk about, we're going to, we're going to briefly uh, go through the Q&A set of Q&A questions available and I'll quickly <clears throat> try to answer them. <laughs> So yeah, let's not wait and let's get started. So first of all, a few words about the company that uh, the time coming from and the company that's giving you this webinar. Uh, so yeah, Companiel. Uh, so we see ourselves as ambassadors for Dynamics Partner Community. Uh, our experience and engagement with partners also shows this in numbers. So if you would add the experience of our staff, we have more than 2,000 years in experience. Uh, to enable cloud, uh, we are hosting more than 1,300 business central customers with their ERP solutions on Azure. We have already spent more than 40,000 hours in Dynamics finance supply chain management development. And yeah, our resellers, we have more than 35 ISVs right now on our marketplace. We, yeah, we also helping uh, partners to scale Dynamics 5 business central finance supply chain management upgrades and, and implementations. And we are currently serving for more than 1,000 partners in the world. So that's that's briefly about Companion. And now uh, let's let's jump to the main topic and uh, let's talk about integrations uh, and um, about integration background and what kind of uh, challenge that we were uh, here uh, to solve. So first of all, why? you should care about integrating Dynamics X2012 and Dynamics 365 finance and supply chain management, right? Everybody has migrated on Dynamics 365. Why you should care about this? Well, it's not really true. Uh, many customers are still running X2012 versions, different versions of it. And when you're migrating to Dynamics 365, what you usually do, especially with global organizations, you migrate company by company or region by region and that creates a gap uh, because let's say you have already rolled out uh, an MX365 in let's say Sweden maybe uh, but the other companies they are still on the X2012 so that creates a gap between those two systems now <clears throat> By default, Dynamics X2012 and Dynamics 365, they have a really nice intercompany process. So if companies are in a single system, you can place sales order, you can sell inventory, which is in Swedish company, on Danish company, uh, and you know, system will take care of these processes of sales orders, purchase orders, inventory, invoicing, everything. It all works nice and well. Now, as I said, let's say we have migrated Sweden to Dynamics 365, but Denmark, Norway, uh, Finland are still on X2012. That bridge, uh, that intercompany link is broken because companies are in different systems. Now, what could be a solution to this problem? 
And uh, actually, we have uh, helped our partners to solve this problem in, in multiple projects already. So the solution could be to build intermediate integration to mimic standard or company. It's actually, it is possible. And uh, yeah, and there might be other uh, scenarios where also integrating the NMX 6012 and the NMX 365 is relevant. Okay, but now let's dig into this one. So what are the specific requirements for these integrations? So if we are talking about intercompany integration and maybe some other integrations, the NMX 365 and NMX 2012 should be integrated in near real time. So users should have <coughs> almost the same, same experience as they used to have, right? You know, users are placing their sales orders so they don't care. So the system should take care about, you know, inventory and invoicing everything. Uh, and that should be in near real time. Integrations should work exactly the same as normal X 2012 processor. Users should have zero impact. Uh, another requirement that we have, remember, we are building here an intermediate solution uh, that, you know, will be scrapped uh, as soon as every, every single company is on the new system. So the integration should cost as little as possible and it should not add large subscription costs and uh, should not, implementation should not cost a lot. And also usability wise, so users, as I mentioned, should have as little impact as possible. But at the same time, having all of that in mind, the former, you know, the price and the usability, that integration should handle at least 10,000 sales orders per day, which is quite a, quite a, quite a volume that we're talking about here. Okay, so uh, how hard it could be, right? Uh, what, what, ki what kind of integration challenges should be there? Sounds straightforward, right? Well, uh, here I would like to stop and uh, I would like actually to give you a question, to give you a quick poll about your experience currently with uh, with solving similar issues. Have you ever tried to integrate uh, integrate Dynamics 365 with Dynamics 6012, those two similar but uh, actually different systems? Okay. So please uh, provide your answers in the in the poll, and uh, uh, I'll quickly review them. Okay, so results are in, and uh, by the looks of it, uh, most of you have voted uh, option A, that is user had to duplicate data manually. Okay, so that's one solution. And probably if we are talking about, you know, not large, uh, not large volumes, probably that makes sense. In our cases, at least the, the, the partners that we work with and the implementations that we were uh, doing, uh, the, the manual option was not really an option because of high volumes that we have. But okay, let's move forward. So integration challenges, how hard can it be, right? X2012 on one side, 10 years old, ERP system, 11 years old already, uh, on-premises ERP system, build around, you know, to be hosted in local networks and do not really talk to, you know, outside of internet because, hey, it's supposed to be in private network of the company. On the other end, we have the Dynamics 365, latest and greatest cloud hosted ERP system that's designed to talk with other applications using Azure, you know, Azure authentication, uh, whole Azure stack basically, and the whole internet that's available there. Okay, so yeah, two quite different systems. How hard could it be, right? So what challenges did we actually face? So first of all, systems are running on different networks. AX2012 runs on-premises, Dynamics 365 runs on Azure. Uh, second challenge, uh, even though these, in, in, these applications are running on different places, in different networks, uh, communication channels must be secured. So the communication channel between on-prem application and the Dynamics 365, which is everywhere in cloud, it's not a single location, by the way. So they must be secured. And that's a challenge. So we cannot just you know, open X12 to the whole internet. We have to be quite careful how we do that. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, we had to make X2012 available for Azure integrations and make it in a safe way. Uh, basically, to not open X2012 to the whole world, so you know we could get 
DOS attacks maybe, or, or yeah, uh, all other security gaps. gaps. And uh, yeah, and, and yeah, it has to be made available for Azure and in a very secure way. <clears throat> Another challenge, integration technologies do not match between systems. Uh, Dynamics 365 has OData, has business events, has dual right, all the great stuff. While Dynamics 2012 has SOAP integrations and yeah, mostly SOAP integrations, which is, you know, again, aged technology, but, but we get what we got. And uh, another challenge having all of that in mind that I have uh, mentioned so far is that integrations must be near real time as we're talking about placing sales orders in real time. So the requirement was basically, you know, sales clerks, they are on the phone, they are making sales order. They want that sales order to be real time. So it, the, the, the sales order appears in the Dynamics 365 and it should go in real time in Dynamics 6, 2012 and check the inventory availability and so on. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, users should not experience waiting time when systems communicate. So that's again about the requirement where they have to be real time. So yeah, how hard can it be? Well, as we figured out, there are quite different and many challenges to be solved. Now, how did we solve that? And uh, specifically, how did we pick the right technologies? So first of all, yeah, what did we pick? And later on, I'll, I'll describe the reasoning why we picked one thing or another. So first of all, to make X2012 available for Azure, we used Azure Active Directory Application Proxy. So this is a solution that might be helpful for you in different scenarios. Uh, if you have to expose X2012 for your modern applications, you know, X2012 is on-prem, but if you want to expose the X2012 to your Azure applications, maybe Power Apps, maybe Logic App, maybe Dynamics 365, as in our case, Azure Active Directory Application Proxy is actually a great tool for that. Um, and out of the whole Azure stack, we found that this is the one that works the best in this scenario. Specifically, exposing X12, let's say to the world, but actually to your Azure, Azure tenants. <clears throat> Second of all, we to build efficient APIs on both sides, we use the custom AF services, so no O data. And I'll get to I'll get uh, back why, but basically yeah, we built custom APIs, just integration to be as efficient as possible. To make not to not make Dynamics 365 users wait, we use business events. So whenever general rule is whenever integration doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be synchronous. You have to face asynchronous patterns, and that means, uh, yeah, you have to be. You have to think about what what are you actually doing there. <clears throat> and I'll get back also to that topic uh, a bit later. Now, to make integration perform, as I mentioned, no O data entities were used. O data is a holy grail in Dynamics 365 integrations, but at the same time, it's really it really doesn't shine in performance side and uh, yeah because we needed this to be fast uh, yeah our data was not an option uh, now to integrate sy systems synchronously between systems when needed uh, we actually use direct calls so basically it is possible both from x2012 to call dynamics 365 apis and from dynamics 365 to call x12 apis that is possible. Again, when you make, you know, when you expose X12 to Azure, then M Series 5 can exit and it's possible. <clears throat> and uh, where it was not direct integration, we we built Azure functions to have efficient middleware solution. Now, yeah, to save costs, we didn't use logic apps because logic apps are charged per run. And at the same time, Power Automate also was not used because, first of all, they are too slow. Second of all, they cost per run. While Azure Functions, they have very little cost. They allow you to build custom code. The code is straightforward usually uh, because it's just, it's just a proxy, right? But at the same time, you can build the code quite easily and save costs. Uh, but of course, yeah, you don't have that fancy user interface. 
but yeah, if you have at least some knowledge in C sharp, you're very good to actually build Logic App. And also some knowledge about how to secure it. So yeah, that's the, these are the technologies that we used. And uh, how did we get there? And uh, how? What are the lessons learned? So first of all, general rule: you must define integration flows very clearly. So you know uh, you need to figure out <clears throat> what type of information has to travel where. I mean, that's again a general rule for integrations, but but it is also a rule. Uh, for integration that uh, you know we have built, you should evaluate synchronous versus synchronous. And I'll get back to that actually a bit later. But you should always evaluate when you have the integration flow defined. You should evaluate what well, do you really need synchronous call? Synchronous is expensive, right? You have to keep that in mind. It's usually more expensive, more difficult to build, and uh, and yeah, it's uh, it's very sensitive to performance. So you should really think about whether you need synchronous or can you make asynchronous integrations. And last lesson, which is really important, is Dynamics 365 has loads of technologies to integrate. So you really need to, uh, probably if you are working on an implementation project, uh, you also have Microsoft Fast Track to support you. Um, but uh, yeah, and if you're working with us, of course, we can support you. Um, but basically, yeah, you, you really need to plan carefully and only pick the right technologies uh, with Dynamics 365 and Azure because it's it's easy to get lost with technologies very quick. There are many, many options how to integrate because Azure has many different options. So really, it's important to pick the right technology for the right integration and the right, even the right piece of the integration that you're building to achieve the best result, both performance-wise and cost-wise. <clears throat> Yeah, so with that, um, I would like to close and yeah, so the result, we built integration and uh, you should also be able to. Uh, so AX2012 and a Dynamics 365, those two different systems, well, not so, not so different, but uh, still possible. It's still possible to integrate them and uh, the integration is currently working. And yeah, we have helped a few customers already, and we are, you know, uh, especially big customers. Uh, when we are working together with our partners in the projects, they are coming back for this request. Um, so yeah, this is something that I believe we are already have some expertise with, and we can really help you. Now, <clears throat> uh, that was one one type of integration, but. Uh, yeah, let's discuss generally. Let's go back to the beginning and let's discuss generally what are Dynamics 365 integration patterns and what you can actually achieve and what are the possible possibilities with Dynamics 365 and what pattern you should use where. So first of all, what are the patterns? So uh, the most popular and probably one of the newest integration ability in Dynamics 365 finance and collection management is uh, Power Platform integration. Uh, next, we have uh, the holy grail of integrations, as I mentioned, the OData. Uh, then we have uh, badge data APIs, actually few APIs uh, already. We have uh, good old custom services. We have uh, external web services that we can consume, and we have Excel integration. Now, <clears throat> I won't elaborate much on Power Platform integration because this is something uh, that's, that's continuously changing and uh, something that has their own purpose. But, uh, and I also won't elaborate on the Excel integration because that sounds straightforward. But yeah, let's dig into all data. Let's dig into batch data API. Let's dig into custom services and, and let's dig into the external web services. So first of all, see, before doing that, let's figure out one important thing as i mentioned before it's crucially important to define what are your integration requirements whether you, you should build synchronous or asynchronous and the questions you need to answer are pretty simple do you need the data in real time what volumes of data we are talking about and what's the frequency if the answer is if you need data in real time then it's probably synchronous, but maybe not. <laughs> uh, if you are talking about high volumes of data, um, then maybe not synchronous, 
uh, maybe you can do a one minute delay or two minute delay or three minutes delay. <clears throat> and when I'm talk, when I'm gonna talk about batch data API and I'm gonna give you examples actually how you could do that. And same as, yeah, what is integration frequency? If it's not real time, if you can push data every minute, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every hour, every day, maybe, then of course it's not synchronous. It can be asynchronous. Uh, and then you need to pick the right tool in the toolbox. <clears throat> so let's talk about technologies that are available. So first of all, uh, the holy grail, OData. OData is usually used when we are talking about real-time integration. A OData can read, OData can write data. And uh, OData is used when simple, simplified business logic is needed, usually the same logic as we have in, you know, in the user interface. So if you want, if you want to give similar information that you're entering by hand in the system, probably good candidate for you is OData because OData has similar business logic, you know, to validate data, to maybe create some missing, uh, you know, maybe cr create some related data and so on. So OData has it all. Uh, and another good reason to use OData is, you know, if you need to integrate, let's say vendors, um, well, good news for you because vendors is already existing OData entity and you don't need to develop anything on Dynamics 365. So it saves you a great deal of costs when building the integration. So that's that's a very, you know, very, very valid argument when you're building integrations. If you need to access data and the entity is already there and we have 2000 entities, I think already, maybe more, uh, then you can use existing uh, audit entity and that saves you uh, a decent amount in costs. Now, <clears throat> some examples when uh, when it's a good idea to use our data. So, usually, it, for real time, uh, if you have some sales portal, for example, um, and you want to create uh, sales orders or update sales orders from that sales portal in Dynamics 365, usually all data is good candidate because you need this real time because your inventory your own hand inventory you know reservations depend on that so you want this to happen real time and that's a good scenario for our data <coughs> sorry um second example is if you want to have again if you have sales portal uh, and you want to get the customer information in real time uh because yeah maybe there are you know maybe your users are changing customer information quite frequently in dynamics uh, and you need to get that information in real time, again, our data is the technology to go. And third option is if you need to approve some journals, um, our data could also be a solution because our data has actions and actions allow you to execute some specific business logic that's related to uh, specific action, let's say from external system. So. It usually has custom code, but again, there are standard actions on our data and it's already available. If not, there are also additional actions uh, that you can code yourself. So yeah, our data has quite good use. Now from my personal experience is, I try to personally avoid our data as much as I can because our data is slow. So you have to keep in mind, usually 10,000, 10,000 OData calls per hour is okay. But yeah, you really need to keep in mind if, if you have high volume, high frequency integration, OData tends to be slow and it has some, Microsoft recently even has introduced some throttling APIs basically uh, to help OData engine itself cope with the, with the high, uh, high frequency of requests. So yeah, uh, great technology, but use with care. Okay, let's move on to another one, custom services. So this one is my personal favorite, but of course it has some drawbacks and some advantages. So <coughs> when to use custom services? First of all, when complex data processing is required, when you need to read or write data and you have some very complex logic to execute, then custom service is the way to go. Second good reason to choose uh, custom service APIs is when API must have extremely good performance. 
when you're building custom service, you are writing the code yourself. That means you have full control of the code that's being executed, not like you know data. Oh, data is a framework, right? And it's uh, it's basically it's a it's an abstraction. Behind that, there's a code that Microsoft built, and there's a lot of code. And that code is sometimes a slow. On custom service, it's only your code and nothing else behind it. So you can have extremely good performance if you build that code right. <clears throat> and second and, and third reason to choose custom services is when you have to build API that must have as simple parameters as required. Again, Custom service is a good example, good choice, because you have full control of, of you know parameters that are required to call service. Not like uh, not like um, O data, you know, O data, you have to provide lots of data, you know, for the request, for example, and maybe you know um, in maybe you don't have that data in your external system. So you will build custom API. Now, good examples <clears throat> is a popular one that Microsoft really is proud about is the on-hand inventory lookup. So this is basically not all data because this is, has to be calculated, and that's uh, and that's that's one example of custom API. Another custom API is you know when you need to post let's say sales invoice maybe, and you want to post sales invoice for a specific uh, specific order maybe with some or maybe some specific quantity. So let's say you only have three, three parameters in your system, or you only have sales order number, you have line number in the sales order, and you have quantity, and you want to post sales invoice out of that. With so little information, we need a lot of business logic, and that's where you're going to go to custom services, and you're going to build that custom service. Now, <clears throat> also clear disadvantage of custom services is that, of course, I'm talking custom, 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 building, building, building. That means we are talking about probably we're gonna blow up the costs for the integration a bit to actually build it, but it will be great return because your integration will work faster. And another slight advantage that, that they haven't actually written down here is if you are migrating or upgrading from X2012 uh, and you had custom APIs there, you can just copy paste that code and that's going to run in the Nemex 365. <clears throat> okay, but that's custom services. Now let's move to something different. And uh, so far, I talked about O data and I talked about custom services, and both of these are synchronous. So you call the service, you get the response right now. <clears throat> now, what to do when you don't have to build synchronous integrations, when you can build asynchronous, then you are going to batch data APIs. So when to choose uh, batch data integration? So first of all, when large volumes of data are required uh, to be transported in or out Dynamics 365, when integrations are executed periodically, and uh, optionally, if let's say you have integration that uh, likes to have incremental updates, that's also where batch data can help you because it has change tracking. So you can, let's say you want to synchronize only the customers that has changed since last time. Um, so you're doing incremental pushes, let's say every every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes. That's where uh, batch data APIs shine, really. Um, and some examples where, where we have used those APIs as first of all, Let's say you have an external system that maintains a database of customers that you have in the Nemix 365, maybe for the same, same sales portal that I was talking about. Uh, right. So <clears throat> to achieve that, you can, you know, that system wants to have customers every 10 minutes. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so how do you achieve that? Well, you basically use batch data API and you ask uh, Dynamics uh, to provide uh, deltas of customers for every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes. And uh, yeah, it works quite nicely. You basically call the API, a uh, data package API. You get the data package out of Dynamics 365. It works really fast, uh, even though, yeah, it's asynchronous, right? It's not real time. So you have to request Dynamics. Dynamics will We'll, we'll, we'll get that package ready. Um, 
in a few minutes, and then you can download uh, the changes for the customers. Uh, another example could be sales portal that creates sales orders for the last hour. So let's say you don't want to integrate the sales orders in real time. Um, <clears throat> maybe you have on-hand integration that's checking, you know, the on-hand of uh, quantities in real time, but you only want to make, you have such high volumes of sales orders that all data is not an option, right? You have 10,000, 20,000 orders per hour. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna build, you're gonna build package with those sales orders, and instead of synchronizing them, uh, sorry, integrating them synchronously, you will be building asynchronous integration and pushing those sales orders every um, every hour, every two hours, every day, maybe hopefully. So yeah, that's that's a really great pattern. You should uh, my personal experience and my personal advice. Uh, is to use it as much as, as you can because this is efficient and uh, you know with some negotiating with business requirements usually it's possible uh, it's possible to negotiate and not have a real-time integration and only uh, use data packages to push data in and out so you're keeping the system load uh, optimized uh, you're not overloading the system with uh, you know synchronous calls and at the same time uh, yeah, you're you're processing a lot of data. So yeah, uh, this is uh, this is my personal favorite. But yeah, you should use it uh, as as often as possible for your integrations. <clears throat> a last pattern that I quickly wanted to dig into: uh, external services. So external services basically this is where you call external service uh, from Dynamics to some external service that's available somewhere in some system. Uh, when you should use it, uh, first of all, when Dynamics 365 is a driving force behind integration, when basically Dynamics 365 should call some system, then you use it, right? <clears throat> and uh, when you should use it, well, when this external system provides some standardized API that works for multiple systems. Uh, good examples of this one is, first of all, currency exchange rate for providers. For example, central banks uh, tend to provide APIs. Uh, I know Dynamics 365 has a standard uh, tools for that, but also, yeah, if you want to have some external exchange rates from some different providers, uh, then you can basically call them. Another good example, which we have seen uh, quite many, many times already is, you know, there is a, there's some government APIs, maybe from tax authorities or uh, <clears throat> that in every country where you need to, send them e invoices or maybe just a VAT declaration. And again, yeah, so they have API. You just need to call it using the Dynamics 365 code directly. That's possible. Uh, or maybe call it some using some middleware, but it's possible actually to embed these calls in Dynamics 365 code. So yeah. So these are some some scenarios where you should uh, where you should use external services. So, with this topic, I think uh, we are we have covered uh, the different integration patterns, and we also uh, before that we talked about uh, the how to integrate Dynamics 2012 and Dynamics 365. Uh, so yeah, I hope uh, you found the topic uh, quite uh, quite attractive, and I hope uh, this give you um, some ideas and and uh, helps you solve the current challenges that you have in your dynamics projects. So yeah, and now it's time uh, to have a quick Q&A session. So uh, please uh, give any questions you have to the chat window and I will try to answer them as good as I can. Thank you.
Okay, just a sec. Okay, now I can see it. <clears throat> yeah, I see some question in the chat window that says that's at the, I'm gonna read the question quickly. So entities don't match in X 2012. Uh, one entity is named uh, X and in Dynamics 365, it might be Y. Do we get some tools for this? Um, yeah, I don't think. Uh, yeah, so let me get this. Uh, officially, Microsoft doesn't provide any tools for this. So if you have to integrate in this way, you will you will have to build middleware. So basically, you will have to build middleware that does the translation on X transit file. Entity looks like this, and the Nmx three five entity looks the other way. Um, so yeah, you're not Microsoft doesn't give tools officially for this, so you have to build integration. Uh, yeah, uh, custom integration middleware. My recommendation would be uh, to build integration middleware using Azure function, or if you want it uh, easier, you can also use it, do it, and build it using. Um, using uh, logic apps which is also quite popular integration solution okay uh, i hope I'd like to thank you uh, 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 we have a checklist what needs to be addressed before migrating to dynamics 35 but also things to do to avoid the failure before migration project uh, we built these uh, these materials. We have executed uh, many migration projects already uh, so far with our partners. So yeah, it, these materials, going through these materials might help you in avoiding some challenges that we have seen in the projects already. And uh, yeah, uh, if you need any help on migrations, Dynamics 365, or generally uh, with you know with with, uh, with basically with uh, building Dynamics 365 solutions to your to your customers, get in touch. We are here to exceed your expectations. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> to request our services, you can just reach out to us uh, using uh, companion.com. You can find the contacts there. So thank you for taking part. If you have any questions, get in touch and uh, have a good rest of the day. And uh, hopefully see you. Uh, see you in our in our mutual collaboration and projects. <clears throat>